Hi, welcome to the College of Health at Lehigh University's colloquium series. Uh, this spring, our colloquium um, set series of talks is focused on the theme of nutrition. Um, uh, I want to, while everyone's continuing to join, welcome in particular some of our applicants and accepted students to our master's and PhD program, who I understand may be joining us today. So the College of Health has um, several uh, graduate programs, including the Master of Public Health, the MS and PhD in Population Health, and in collaboration with the College of Business, a dual master's program in which students can earn both the MPH and an MBA. So uh, we are excited to have you all join us. Uh, I will also mention that all of those courses are hybrid and applications to the master's programs are still open. Um, I'm thrilled today uh, to introduce our speaker. He's really the reason for the focus on nutrition in the series in the spring. Um, it's a way of celebrating his latest book, which we're gonna be hearing about. So uh, Dr. Ed Gomez is an associate professor in the College of Health and director of the Institute of Health Policy and Politics at Lehigh University. A political scientist by training, Dr. Gomez's research focuses on the politics of international and domestic health policy reform in developing nations. His research has appeared in several leading ac academic and policy journals and the media. He has published four books, with the latest being Junk Food Politics, How Beverage and Fast Food Industries Are Reshaping Emerging Economies, which just came out with Johns Hopkins University Press in 2023. Last year, he led the Lancet's inaugural special series on political science and global health. Dr. Gomez's research has been supported by the Rockefeller Foundation, Oxfam, and the George Soros and Tinker Foundations. Previously, Dr. Gomez was a faculty member at King's College London and at Rutgers University, and was a pre-doctoral fellow at the Harvard School of Public Health. He has consulted for the World Bank and has also worked for the Rand Corporation. After serving in the US Air Force, Dr. Gomez completed his BA degree in government and foreign affairs at the University of Virginia, an MA in international relations at the University of Chicago, and his PhD in political science from Brown University. We are really excited that he's sharing his um, newest research with us today. And I just want to say one housekeeping thing. Feel free to drop questions into the chat because we'll have time for a Q&A uh, later, or sorry, not into the chat, but in the Q&A um, as they occur to you. So we won't stop and answer them. We'll answer them at the end. But if you want to record them as they come up in your mind, that would be great. So uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Gomez. Thank you so much, uh, Dean Dolan, and thank you for everyone for taking the time today. For those of you in the Bethlehem area, it's a nice snowy day outside and hope that uh, uh, you're uh, able to uh, work safely today out in the environment. And such an honor to be here today, as uh, Dean Dolan mentioned, uh, this is a colloquium series that we started a few years ago. And it's my turn to participate in the colloquium series. <laughs> and I'm just so honored to, to be here today and share my research with all of you. I'm gonna share my screen now. And uh, just one second, second as I, I uh, load up my PowerPoint. And I uh, hope everyone should be able to see that. Um, the title for today um, is The Politics of Food and Malnutrition, Understanding the Rise and Influence of Junk Food Industries and the Role of Government in Developing Nations. And in this topic is the politics of global food and malnutrition policy is a new area of research. Many of you know that work in nutrition policy and political scientists that especially with regards to developing countries, emerging middle income countries, taking a political perspective to this topic is very new. And, and why politics? Why do I emphasize that? Not only because I'm trained and formally trained in political science, but it's very important uh, analytically uh, as we try to understand uh, nutrition policy and politics and malnutrition throughout the world. The field of political science provides theoretical and methodological tools for better understanding the reasons why policies are or are not pursued in response to nutrition challenges. And this approach allows us to investigate the role of various states, that is presidential, bureaucratic, congressional, and non-state interest groups and civil societal actors. And they're in the policymaking process. In the 
differences in power and influence between these groups, why interest groups backed by industry have much more resources and power than civil societal activists, right? And so this field of study provides us with some tools that I'll talk about in a little bit um, of how we can better understand this process in the area of malnutrition. In the area of nutrition, this approach also helps to explain why some policies, for example, soda tax, are prioritized over others. For example, food advertising regulations and the challenges to enforcing these regulations. But we face a global problem of childhood obesity. As all of you know, for many, many years, um, our children have been seen and adolescents have been seeing a steady increase in the number of, 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 of obese children. And here's a graph provided by the WHO um, that sort of illustrates between the ages from five to 19, the rapid increase in uh, obesity among children and adolescents. And we see here the gray line uh, shows the Americas, including the US, but also all of South America uh, as far higher than a lot of the different regions here. But it's important to note that the, uh, the, the WHO argued uh, three years ago that the vast majority of overweight or obese children live in developing nations where the rate of increase has been more than 30% higher than that of developed countries. I think it's a very startling finding and something that I talk about in my book that is, is something that we, should, we all need to be aware of. The World Obesity Federation in 2019 projected which countries um, would see over 1 million obese school-aged children and youth in 2030. And here's the, the top 10, there's a longer list, but I chose the top 10. And you can see here, China, India, and the US uh, rank in the top 10. But if you'll notice the rest of the countries, Indonesia, Brazil, Egypt, Mexico, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Africa, what do all of them have in common? All of them are emerging middle-income countries. And so it's really startling to see what the World Obesity Federation projects and where uh, most school-aged children and youth will be with obesity by 2030. But how has the World Health Organization responded? And I start off my book with a wonderful quote by the former Director General uh, of the WHO, Margaret Chan. Um, and she argued in 2016 at a, at a National Academy of Medicine conference, so you can see the image here, and quoting her, she argued, when crafting preventative strategies, government officials must recognize that the widespread occurrence of obesity and diabetes throughout our population it's not a failure of individual willpower to resist fats and sweets or exercise more. It is a failure of political will to take on powerful economic operators like the food and soda industries. If governments understand this duty, the fight against obesity and diabetes can be won. The interests of the public must be prioritized over those of corporations. And this was a, a first time the WHO and now subsequent leaders have made similar comments, but this is the director of the WHO making this bold statement uh, in 2016. And I sort of questioned um, in the emerging economies, have governments taken on this call of duty that Margaret Chan uh, uh, emphasized? And unfortunately, no, uh, the situation only appears to be getting worse where governments are not effectively regulating and trying to tackle the childhood obesity problem and diabetes. There are several questions that emerged from my book and here's a copy of the front cover. Uh, the first is after several impressive non-communicable disease prevention policies such as soda taxes, why have governments not implemented effective regulations? For example, food label, advertisement, and sales restrictions. I started off my research before the book several years ago, comparing the US and Brazil and highlighting Brazil's success in increasing nutritional awareness, highlighting Mexico's success in introducing soda taxes, and increasing nutritional awareness. But when it came to regulations, restricting what industries can do and marketing their foods to children, providing more effective labels, um, that was not as successful. And that was a big paradox for me. Why are children in the poor disproportionately affected by the absence of these regulations in the emerging economies? 
And finally, how can political science interest group and institutional theory be combined with the public health literature to better understand and explain this problem? See, there's some, these were the major questions that drove um, the writing of this book. So the analytical approach that I take uh, for this topic and in my book is what I call an industry politics and complementary institutions framework. And this framework brings together the extensive literature in political science that talks about interest groups in the case of the, uh, in, in, the in the literature in political science. This is an area that's been dominated by American healthcare, uh, American health politics and other uh, uh, scholars in American politics brings together the literature on institutions and commercial determinants of health and public health to provide a, a different way of understanding and explaining the process. And it begins with uh, what I call industry fear and opportunity. What motivates industries to go into developing countries to become politically involved. Industry fear of declining sales in the West and industrialized nations and an opportunity to invest in economies that are new, where there's a rising middle income class and where, there, where foods uh, have historically not been as available, junk foods have historically not, not available as much as in the West. The next step is combining this interest group literature and the political science institutional change literature, specifically conversion theory, with the rich corporate political activity and commercial determinants of health literature, which is new, and trying to put together an explanation for the different tactics that industries use to influence policy. But it also applies the corporate social responsibility literature that explains what industries do to help in society, such as providing education, healthcare services, uh, to be a good citizen. But it highlights the consequences of these activities for establishing broader civic mobilization where civic activists in nutrition have a difficult time working with other researchers that are, are aligned and supported by industry. And I'll give a couple of examples about that later. Finally, this, this framework emphasizes and introduces what I call complementary institutions. And these are presidential strategies that use industry partnerships to achieve alternative policy objectives. It can be economic growth, it can be anti-hunger. Um, and so how presidents work with industries to achieve these alternative political goals and sometimes build institutions to ensure that this partnership is strengthened. And ultimately this framework explains the outcome of interest, uh, which is in the emerging economies, the absence of effective food labels, advertising and sales regulations but especially in schools. But what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna to turn to a couple of case studies that I discussed in the book. I, I discussed several case studies, Mexico, India, Brazil, Indonesia, China, South Africa. But I'm gonna choose the cases of Mexico and India, sort of in Latin America and Southeast Asia for some regional diversity and sort of walk through and explain how this analytical framework helps to explain the situation in these countries. In Mexico, as in all of you know, as an emerging middle income country, uh, we've seen foreign direct investment from the beverage sector, from a lot of industries emerge rapidly in, since 1996. North American Free Trade Agreement, which eliminated tariffs in trade between the US, Canada and Mexico. Uh, many of you may not know this, but Mexico actually ranks third in the world for the most per capita millionaires in the world. It's the US, Russia and Mexico. The last time I checked in statistics. And a lot of this had to do with the vast investments in, in, in businesses and manufacturing, the Macadadora manufacturing industry in the north of, of Mexico and all the foreign investment that came in from the US. And a lot of this was uh, attributed to fear uh, of, of, of you know, for example, sodas and junk foods, declining sales in the US and opportunity, seeing Mexico as a new market open to free trade, the emergence of a, a growing middle income class, they're very much interested in purchasing these products and consuming them. Coca-Cola has invested in many countries throughout the world, but take a look at how big the investment has been in the Americas. Mexico has been by far outside of the US, 
The largest investment with $12.4 billion between 2010 and 2020, this data was provided by Taylor and Jacobson in 2013, followed by Brazil with 7.6 billion. Um, Africa, of course, being the and the African region being the largest uh, investment. But in the Americas, it's really striking to see just how much Coca-Cola has invested in Mexico. During this time, we've also seen Mexico lead the US and globally and the consumption of Coca-Cola sodas per capita. And this is a wonderful data that uh, Kilpatrick provided in 2015 that I think will be shocking to many of you, especially in the US. You think that in the US, you know, we drink a lot of sodas. We love you know, watching our football games with sodas, but actually it's Mexico that leads the world in Coca-Cola sodas per capita per day, according to this data with 11.3 ounces. The US falls second and globally, uh, third, annually, uh, according to Kilpatrick, the average Mexican drinks close to 12 ounces a can of Coca-Cola soda every day, which adds up to about 32.3 gallons a year. And you can see here what that translates to when you're thinking about uh, how much that is. All right. And so this is a very startling finding that I think in many of you, I've lived in Mexico and have seen sort of the Coca-Cola culture in Mexico has a very long history uh, uh, in that country. At the same time, you've seen in Mexico a rise in childhood obesity rates. Uh, this data taken from the World Health Organization in 2021, you see from the ages of five to nine, from 2006 to 2016, an ongoing increase in childhood obesity, but also adult diabetes, type two diabetes especially, which has been increasing dramatically. And I'm still interested in getting the data on adolescent diabetes, but I talk about several studies in my book, how type two diabetes is becoming younger and younger in Mexico and in a lot of emerging economies. But what was Mexico's policy response? Well, many of you may not know, Mexico was the very first country in the world to establish a sugar sweetened beverages and junk food tax. Uh, this idea, however, was introduced in 20, uh, 2003 and took many years to pass. Uh, eventually in 2013, the government adopts this tax which was a uh, for soda, one peso per, uh, per liter, and for uh, junk foods such as potato chips, sweets, and cereal, an 8% sales tax. In tw 2010, the National Agreement for Healthy Nutrition uh, generates guidelines and nutritional standards for foods and beverages and provides national school feeding guidelines to reduce high caloric value of foods, bans, sodas, and schools, but a lot of research and a lot of studies I talk about in my book suggest that these were not enforced in many schools throughout, throughout Mexico. In 2013, the National Strategy for Prevention and Control of Overweight, Obesity, and Diabetes Regulations restricted TV advertisements towards children for specific days and times. But then this, this effort did not really address what, we, what I would argue, and I'm sure many would of you agree, social media and how social media has increased dramatically the advertisements of these unhealthy foods. In 24, the 2014 Farno Package GDA guide daily, uh, guideline daily amounts label revisions were also substantially delayed. There was an interest for many years to updating these food labels and it wasn't until 2021 when the food labels were corrected and the black octagon symbols were provided on foods. But overall, I found that it was Mexico was a case of being strong on prevention, on increasing knowledge and awareness of nutrition, but not as uh, effective in the areas of regulation. So what happened? Well, for many years, the soda tax was delayed due to intensive lobbying from congressional uh, uh, to con lobbying congressional members from interest groups such as the Camara Nacional de las Industrias Azucaradas y Alcoholera, which is the the uh, and the the, front, the uh, representative group, uh, the an interest group that represents uh, sugar and alcohol. They lobbied for many years how the soda tax would, would cost a lot for sugarcane farmers and the economy, and were successful in sort of delaying this, this legislation, but also industry partnerships with the Ministry of Health, for example, uh, companies uh, working with the Ministry of Health to provide exercise schools and programs, and this sort of helped to delay or avoid the regulations or enforcement of regulations. 
Another problem in Mexico I talk about is called institutional infiltration. And the OMENT, the Mexican, uh, Mexican Observatory for NCDs, was a national advisory council uh, that was provided to monitor and provide advice on non-communicable disease policies, the ones that I mentioned previously. And for many years, this council was uh, had an overrepresentation of industry inf uh, interests, and um, civil society and nutrition activists were not really represented within this council, which monitored and provided recommendations on non-communicable diseases. You also had uh, the funding of industries of major uh, uh, org, uh, you know. Um, think tanks and foundations like ConMexico that sponsored tax policy research, supported academics and NGOs. And I argue that this sort of made civic mobilization where activists fighting for children's health, very difficult to, for them to mobilize with academic researchers. Uh, they were supported by industry indirectly through ConMexico um, to, to really mobilize and address this issue. But one other tactic the industries used was corporate social responsibility. And this was provided, for example, by several examples in my book, but one good example was an employment programs for women in Nestle's uh, Negocio, or My Sweet Business Initiative, which provided uh, employment opportunities for women and how this, I argue in my book, increases industry popularity and legitimacy as seeing and being a good corporate actor and helping empower women in society in Mexico. But complementary institutions also matter. What is that? That's indirect presidential support. Many of you may not know this, but one of the former presidents of Mexico, Vicente Fox, from 2000 to 2006, was a former Coca-Cola executive. And in many ways, this facilitated Coca-Cola's connections with government and policy influence. Subsequent presidents, President Felipe Calderón uh, from 2006 to 2012, also uh, allowed Pepsi to work with the Secretary of Public Education to create school exercise programs. President Enrique Peña Nieto uh, in 2012 to 2018 worked with Nestle to achieve his national anti-hunger campaign. And one of the things that I talked about earlier about complementary institutions was when presidents partner with industry to achieve alternative goals, right? To achieve, uh, to reduce anti-hunger, to reduce poverty. Similar situation happened in Brazil with uh, Zero Fome. I talk about in my book and other programs that try to address hunger and poverty and working with industry to do that. Um, but all of this uh, supportive presidential environment can amplify industry legitimacy and help avoid costly regulations. And this certainly didn't help that presidents in Mexico were seen in public drinking this products, right? Can you imagine one of uh, any other president or president in the US going on, you know, on TV with this kind of product or McDonald's products or any kind of other foods? Uh, this sends a, a big signal to society, right? It sends a big message. And perhaps this is not the wisest thing that should be done, but as you can, I can imagine, it increases the popularity of the product. Now, India, uh, India like Mexico, uh, was for many years um, a government that was dominated by a central political party, saw a gradual increase in market reform and influx in foreign direct investment. As we all know, India is one of the biggest emerging economies in the world. But foreign direct investment in the beverage industry and the food industry was very slow beginning in, during the 1960s and 70s, during a, a more... Um, socialist governments that were inclusive, that were more the, the producing domestically. Um, and at the time, in my research, I found that the government was concerned that Coca-Cola was entering villages. And in fact, uh, George Fernandez, one of the industry um, uh, ministers at the time, um, talked about, uh, was concerned that the Coke was entering the communities. And I just want to take quote uh, George Fernandez. Uh, in my book, I have this quote, uh, which he gave uh, in 1977 when talking about Coke. And he said, and I quote him here, when I chucked out Coca-Cola in 1977, I made the point that 90% of India's villages did not have safe drinking water, whereas Coke had reached every village. Do we really need Coke? Do we need Pepsi? I found that really striking that back then you thought it seemed to be politician was very concerned about the health of 
the villagers, right? And sort of coping there when access to high quality water was not. But in the end, what I found is this was a political tactic to really not to de-emphasize Coke and introduce India's own product, right? Eventually, soda was seen as a symbol of democracy and national pride in India. Why? In 1977, in response to threats of authoritarian rule under Prime Minister Indira Gandhi, the Nationalist Democratic Janata Party created a domestic soda, Double Seven, as a sign of better days to come and a return to the democratic normalcy. And you can see these posters here that were uh, visible about using soda to show the sign of democracy, new, new, new uh, horizon. Um, and seeing soda being politicized and used by politicians to emphasize this point. Now, get it, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the current prime minister is doing something similar, but I want to give you a sense of the history of politicizing soda products and how they can be used for political and object uh, and, and alternative political reasons. Neoliberal economic trade starts to take off during the 1990s with foreign direct investment in the food and beverage sector. And we see massive change in the, uh, by the late 1990s in foreign direct investment and economic growth in India. But we see, of course, childhood obesity increasing during this period. From 2006 to 2016, the WHO reports that a massive increase uh, from five, ages five to nine in childhood obesity, as well as uh, adult diabetes increasing uh, during this period dramatically. And those of you that follow the situation, India, I would argue India, Mexico, uh, the U.S., China are sort of the global leaders when it comes to diabetes and obesity. And we're seeing, as I talked about in my book, although I couldn't get global data on this, adolescent diabetes uh, increasing dramatically in India in recent years. What was India's policy response? Well, NCD obesity and type 2 diabetes prevention pro pro programs were substantially delayed because for many years in India, the focus is on malnutrition and poverty. Of course, India is um, like Brazil uh, and even the US, large populations of poverty, malnourishment, undernourishment, and government officials for many years were perplexed on what they should emphasize. And so uh, the, there was a substantial delay in recognizing or realizing that something had to be done for obesity among children and type two diabetes. NCD prevention and monitoring at-risk groups really began in 2006 with the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare Report. In 2008, the Ministry of Women and Children Development created the National Guidelines on Diet and Exercise. School Dietary and Nutrition Guidelines were provided. In 2008, National Program for Prevention, Control of Cancer, Diabetes, and Cardiovascular Disease and Stroke, which was the biggest national government initiative on NCDs, uh, this emphasized early diagnosis of management, recommended behavioral lifestyle changes, and risk detection, but nothing on regulations. In 2015, the, the Ministry of Women and Child Development also recommended that no junk food vendors within 200 meter radius of schools, the shops, recommend, uh, shops were recommended to prohibit selling these foods to children in uniforms, in 2018, the Federal, the Food Safety and Standards Authority of India, the FSSAI, which is the national regulatory agency, stated, uh, created an Eat Right campaign to help reduce intake of sugar, salt, and fat. And again, this is a prevention awareness campaign. And in 2020, Prime Minister Modi created the Fit India campaign, which again emphasizes the importance of exercise. And that's something that the industries, food and the beverage industries, have always argued that it's really more about exercise and not necessarily what you're eating. But if you notice, all of these really are emphasizing prevention, awareness, measuring risk, all right, and food uh, and exercise campaigns but they're not really addressing what I argued is the core of the problem, which is regulating advertising sales, right? So the policy success and challenges have been that, interestingly, India has adopted a 2017, 2017 tax on uh, sweetened carbonated drinks and water, which was lumped together with tobacco, tax at 28% through the 2017 goods and services tax, and another 12% tax called the compensation cess Syntax, uh, a syntax historically used for tobacco, now includes 
um, it, you know, the, these, uh, these sweetened carbonated beverages. Um, and this estimated to rupees 15.6 per liter for colas would actually translate to a tax that's higher than Mexico's. However, one challenge is existing food labels provide in, in, insufficient information and misleading statements as I document in my book. Despite Modi's 2014, Prime Minister Modi's 2014 interest in banning junk food sales in schools, today no senior regulation exists. Only high court, uh, like the Supreme Court, mandated FSSAI, which is a federal agency, federal guidelines exist. Some states, such as Punjab, Nagaland, Mahadastra, have adopted soda sales provisions, but this is just three states of the many in India. To date, no federal or state regulations banning advertisements of foods high in salt, sugar, and fat that children exist. Instead, only industry self-regulation persists. And this self-regulation is what many companies around the world have done, where industries pledge not to advertise their products towards uh, children. Uh, and so this has been monitored in India by the Private Advertising Agencies Association of India and Advertising Standards Council of India. Junk food advertising towards children persists, as I talk about in my book, and that's still a major problem in India, as well as in other countries, including the US. So what happened? Much like in Mexico, uh, policy partnerships with government were, were present. Coca-Cola worked with state governments to provide health and education services through Coke's Support My School program and worked with New Delhi TV, government and UN Habitat to improve school children's health and water and sanitation. In 2017, Coca-Cola India partnered with the regulatory agency, FSSAI, to provide training to street vendors for the provision of healthy and safe food and improved hygiene and waste management. Isn't that interesting that Coke is partnering with the federal agency to improve the quality of food, right? But then not being very interested in regulating the advertisements of what we would consider to be unhealthy foods. These policy partnerships created, I argue, no incentives to pursue strong federal regulations in the area of uh, sales and advertising. Another uh, 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 tactic that we saw is lobbying, which is an industry in India that is not as regulated as it is here in the US. And we saw India, all India Food Processors Association lobbying high court judges about what constitute junk food in schools. There's a long debate about what is junk food, right? Is it always chocolates or is it, is it really hamburgers? Um, the IFPA lawyer claimed also that the FSSAI, which is the federal regulatory agency, is the only one responsible for junk food regulations, not the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, right? But this, as I talk about in my book, the FSSAI was in many ways captured by the food and beverage industry through institutional infiltration. So it does make sense, right, that they would argue that the Ministry of Health is not equipped to handle these regulatory matters. They, the FSSAI should really be handling these, these matters. And by the way, this is an institution that they're infiltrating, right? Um, the interest group, the AIFPA that I mentioned earlier had a presence within the high court uh, committee discussing what junk food guidelines are. The IFPA also was present on the FSSA scientific committees on nutrition and, and other policies. But corporate social uh, activities and corporate social respons uh, um, responsibility activities was highly visible in India. And I have many cases in my book that I talk about. Nestle, for example, Healthier Kids program, which provides awareness on good nutritional practices, healthy cooking methods, and importance of exercise in schools. This was praised by parliament and helped increase industry legitimacy. And one of the major ones that um, I was shocked to discover was Coca-Cola's uh, Splash Bars, which is an initiative to help empower women in rural areas of India uh, by, by establishing these small Splash Bars. You can get a tiny shot of Coca-Cola for three rupees, uh, which is very, very cheap. Um, 
by, by 2016, more than 30,000 splash bars were provided uh, throughout India. And as John Quincy, uh, who the CEO of Coca-Cola stated recently, uh, India certainly been growing and there's a lot of the focus on affordability. You can see some of the splash bars, which is the cheapest, most accessible Coke you can probably buy in the world. And so Coke saw this as a way to empower women to make them leaders in their community. But at the same time, this is one way where Coke has worked with through corporate social responsibility to expand access to their products at a very, very cheap rate in, uh, in cities and also the, uh, remote areas of India. Now, once again, complementary institutions mattered. And political leaders in India and other emerging economies play a very powerful role in emerging markets. And here, uh, Prime Minister Modi, for example, has met with international CEOs to encourage foreign direct investment. In September, this picture here, uh, Prime Minister Modi attended the Bloomberg Global Business Forum, where leaders, Coca-Cola, many companies were present and where he encouraged investors to invest in India, where there's a you know, democracy, safe environment. Uh, and so that again was, I talk about Modi's efforts to really achieve his goal of economic growth and prosperity uh, and being in drawing in more foreign investment. Modi also has partnered with PepsiCo's former CEO, Indra Noi, to help farmers. At one point, Modi re uh, requested that, uh, that soda producers use uh, ingredients from farmers' fresh fruits to help empower farmers and increase their income. Um, and uh, Indra Noi also agreed to help you know, in support farmers and to achieve the prime minister's development goals. And there was a partnership between PepsiCo and, uh, and Modi on this very initiative. Uh, these partnerships, I, I provide some other examples in the book, these partnerships have provided indirect support for industry, making regulation very difficult to achieve in India. So in conclusion, in the area of nutrition, a political science perspective reveals the reasons why governments have not achieved effective prevention and regulatory policies. Political science provides us with some tools and ways to explain why industry continues to be so influential, whether it be uh, you know, lobbying government, infiltrating institutions, um, um, and why certain policies get priorities over others. Why soda tax, for example, seems to be the more popular choice versus uh, creating regulations uh, and advertising regulations. In the book, I argue that junk food politics is a two-way street. What that means is that many times we're very quick to point the finger at these emerging industries and what they're doing, all the different tactics they're doing in government and civil society. You know, we're always blaming industry. We have to also understand that we need to blame government, right? And that a lot of what we're seeing in the emerging economies in Mexico and India and other countries and presidents who are partnering with these industries to achieve alternative political, economic, and social welfare goals. Given the ongoing increase in childhood obesity and poor industry regulatory performance, governments can no longer afford to partner with major industries, obviously for these policy reasons, but also because it gives the wrong signal to society, right? And sort of gives the impression that these products are okay. But governments must also commit to increasing activist and nutrition research presence within policymaking institutions and establishing an effect of counterweight to industry's presence and influence within government entities and policymaking institutions, right? I still have not seen in the emerging economies a very strong commitment of governments working with nutrition activists, working with researchers, working with community members and ensuring their voice and influence within nutrition policy uh, institutions. And finally, the emerging economies, Mexico, India, Brazil, China, Indonesia, need to start viewing nutrition policy as a way to bolster their international reputation and health. As I talked about in my previous book, Geopolitics and Health, governments are always aspiring to show the world how successful they are in tackling disease, ensuring that their societies are healthy, that they can you know, they develop healthy societies, a strong economy. And they did this for HIV AIDS. 
but they can do it now for nutrition and especially children's health. And it's time that governments strive to increase their global reputation in addressing children's health through these tackling these foods, taking on the big power and influence of industries like Margaret Chan told us at the very beginning and showing the world that these governments are truly committed to children's health and prosperity. Thank you very much. Oh, you're, 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 uh, thank um, you. You're... Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Gomez, for a really interesting um, talk. Uh, I especially love the photo of the two presidents of Mexico holding the, <laughs> the can and bottle. It's very telling. Um, yes. So we have a few questions already in the Q&A, and I just want to invite everyone who's listening to enter questions into the Q&A, and we will, um, we will take them up one at a time. So the first question, Dr. Gomez, is from James Spinner, um, and he asks, what role can the multilateral development banks, like the Inter-American Development Bank and the World Bank, play in funding projects to strengthen anti-obesity and health diet programs? Healthy diet Absolutely. programs, sorry. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, uh, Mr. Mr. Spinner. Uh, this is a wonderful um, uh, question. Uh, certainly, I believe that they can do a lot in increasing awareness in the, the multilateral banks, Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, have for many years invested in, in, in advancing health uh, and anti-poverty alleviation programs all throughout, uh, throughout the world. And these institutions, all of us know, are the, you know, arguably the leaders in funding um, um, healthcare projects. The World Bank, I believe, has the most money committed to this of, of any organization around the world. And so this puts them in a very strong position to help fund campaigns on anti-obesity and diet programs. And I think this is something that, you know, these multilateral corporations should be doing to show the world how important this is. And it is good that uh, the, uh, we saw from uh, Margaret Chan, the former WHO director, another UN entity, that is taking a stance, right? Is taking a stance, a radical stance on addressing this issue. And I think that these banks are in a very good position to do this. Um, thank you. Great. So um, next question is from AJ Marwaha. Um, do you consider decrease in the use of tobacco in America a public policy success or failure? And can we learn anything from tobacco? And what multi-pronged approach do you propose to address junk food consumption? This is a great question, something I talk about in my class in the commercial determinants of health. And I start off by emphasizing that this literature in large part started with the tobacco industry. Um, it was certainly a success, I would argue, in the U.S. Um, and it had a lot of history going to the beginning in the 70s and 80s with massive campaigns throughout the U.S. about the dangers of tobacco consumption and, of course, a tobacco tax with the Obama administration increasing the tax to help fund anti-obesity initiatives. And I think this is something that can be done um, and this should be done in the area of, of, of soda. We, as we all know, in some states in the US have adopted soda taxes in California and throughout other states in the US. And I, I think that we've learned from tobacco that this can have an impact. The prices of tobacco products have certainly increased dramatically. Many would argue that the soda taxes at the state level or even Mexico are not enough. And I think that may have been one of the reasons why the Obama administration pursued an increase in tax, right? If uh, globally, uh, even after a tax uh, in countries like Mexico, the bottled water is still uh, much, uh, much more expensive than Coca-Cola, then that suggests that maybe we should increase taxes further, right? But I certainly think that it was a success and the tobacco sort of provide that, provided that example. And a multi-pronged approach uh, to addressing junk food. I think that what I've learned and what I've seen is that one particular initiative is not enough. The soda tax, junk food taxes are not enough. What really needs to be done is also, again, these regulations. Uh, on advertising sales. But um, that is where uh, the problem is. A lot of these industries are, are afraid of this and are fighting very aggressively to avoid these regulations. But I think a really successful approach would be to combine all these policies perspectives, all these policy approaches. And I just haven't seen that done. I think Chile is the only country that I can think of, and I didn't talk about that today, where they have done a tax, where they have done advertising regulations, 
Uh, and it's been very effective. And we're seeing success in Chile in terms of reductions in childhood obesity. Um, and it's something that I've been looking into. And I think that's one country in the Americas that we can look into uh, for some examples. Okay. Great, thank you. thank you so much. So the next question is from Michael Guzmano who asks, you make a convincing argument that existing practice is bad for public health, but do you see any political penalty for governments that continue the pattern of behavior you describe? Yes, absolutely. This is a very important question. Um, it can be in some of these countries that I talk about, um, these, the penalty could be not supporting these candidates, right? Not you know, stopping it, not really, um, you know, you know, of course, they, you know, we will never know what sort of the, the campaign donations, and that's not visible, but publicly supporting camp politicians could be very costly. Um, and so one good example uh, about the fears of distancing themselves from industry is recently in Mexico, the president AMLO, who uh, was a you know, very leftist president, uh, has been committed to anti-poverty and, and corruption and campaign on anti-corruption and conflict of interest. And um, shortly after becoming going into the presidency, he meets with Coca-Cola CEO executive, right? And this shocked many, right? Because people thought, well, he was really committed to nutrition and in the fighting conflict of interest. But that really signaled to me that there's a fear of not meeting with these powerful entities and Coca-Cola being so powerful in Mexico and the fear of political consequences of Coca-Cola not wanting to meet with AMLO and supporting him uh, in a context where it's infiltrated culturally, politically. Um, and so what has happened recently is very interesting is AMLO has started to back off and distance himself it seems and may, has recently made a public statement last year that Coca-Cola is bad for your health. And uh, that's a radical departure from when he, you know, uh, you know, from actually meeting with Coca-Cola. And so it's only time will tell how, how that will, um, you know, what will that cost the government for doing something like that. But I do sense that there is a fear and I haven't seen of any concrete, concrete examples in the case studies that I've read about pulling away from supporting these industries. Uh, because most of them of all presidents have worked with them. But I do think that there's a fear there that is that is uh, that is present. Mm. Really interesting. Um, so the next question is from Dean Georgette Phillips. Is there any data about the percentage of sugar drinks from Coca-Cola versus non-sugar like Dasani water? Um, now, I think that there is, um, um, a uh, I think that there is a lot of uh, you know sugar drinks from Coca-Cola, certainly. And that has sort of been, and from what I understand in recent, recent trends in the US, that that consumption has really started to decline on regular Coca-Cola, but increase in Diet Coke. So it seems to be like the Diet Coke has been very popular still. And uh, it's one issue that you mentioned, non-sugar like Dasani, because that is a water product. And many people do know that, you know, that uh, uh, Coca-Cola and other, other uh, major soda producers are involved in the production of, uh, of water bottling and water. And that's very, very popular. Um, and so I think there's just been an increase still uh, in, in profitability and sales of Coke, both sugary products and, and, and water, uh, uh, water bottles. But I think the recent data has shown that there's been sort of a decline in the regular Coke and an increase in diet and Diet Coke. Right, thank you. <clears throat> so um, the next person um, asking a question asks if you could put the photo up again of the two presidents. Ah, uh, sure. From your slides. Yeah. And, and while you do that, I'll ask another question from, from Lisa Jaffe, which is um, the second to last one on the list. Um, do you think that the RDV of sugars will ever be listed on food labels? And I understand these industries fight this. So this is Lisa Jaffe. Um, okay, I, I see. Second I, to last question. I skipped down a little oh, bit. Oh, okay. So the, oh, yeah. So that's that's a very good question. So sort of that's something that's always been uh, fighting. It could possibly be, although the the uh, the industry could far. Uh, a fight very hard to do that. Uh, in my other country uh, case studies, um, sugar content and the the um, provision of sugar content on labels has been one of the most difficult things to achieve. Um, and um, you know, I think that 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 will be an ongoing struggle. 
And, um, and I think that, you know, only time will tell. Certainly that should be listed on food labels. Um, uh, but, uh, but, you know, I think that's something um, that, that, you know, that, that is one thing. Just one thing about, about you know, uh, food labeling is not really visible as much in the public, right? And this is what we call quiet politics and junk food politics, where a lot of regulations and fights of these regulations are not very visible. But I think this is one area that is very important for industries and we'll see, continue to see, you know, uh, you know efforts to really block that. Um, well, I'm sorry, Beth, what were you gonna say? Oh, nothing. Oh, so here is the, uh, the, um, the picture of the uh, two presidents and um, let's see here. What was the question about it or did they I just- I request to see the picture again. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's very striking. Um, Okay, so moving on uh, to another question. This one's from Erica Holscher. Um, when you say that Coca-Cola has invested in various countries, what exactly does that mean? Is it that they invest in their own business interests there? Uh, what that means is sort of they are expanding in marketing and sales uh, and, and distribution of their products. Um, uh, and so that's what I sort of meant by that. Uh, and sort of all, it, it entailed all of their activities really as well, not only sales, but also their marketing and advertising campaigns, but also, uh, you, know, you know, working with governments and, and sort of different kinds of uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives. Uh, that's sort of what I meant by that. Okay, great. Thank you <clears throat> for that clarification. So um, another question from Erica Holscher. Are there any implications for socioeconomic class when it comes to the increase in childhood obesity and diabetes? Sure. Um, so I think that, I mean, I think that's something that in terms of implications of socioeconomic class, um, when it comes to increase, I think that the ongoing increase of childhood obesity and diabetes in low income families is something that is continuing in these emerging economies. One striking thing that I found was that uh, in these countries, and much like in the U.S., we're seeing these cases of childhood obesity and adolescent diabetes in poor rural areas and poor areas of cities. But in some countries, like in China, for example, you are seeing them in uh, upper middle income classes as well. So like the socioeconomic disparity or the focus on poverty, as we see in the U.S. and other countries, is not as big of a disparity in some countries like China or even India where we do see where culturally sometimes these foods are very popular among middle income and upper, upper classes uh, in addition to the poor. But I do think that in general, we are seeing um, um, sort of this you know, ongoing increase in poor communities and cities and rural areas uh, as still being a, a challenge. Thank you. Sure. Um, another question from Bryce Neff. How can researchers make a significant change in these countries? The influence of, I'm guessing, millions of dollars of investment is hard to ignore or decline for the sake of the healthier choices. Is there any standard, or are there any standards in addressing conflicts of interest among these re regulatory bodies? Oh, that's a great question, Bryce. Um, the one issue of uh, conflict of interest in research is something that has not been effectively addressed in these countries. In many countries that I talk about in my book, uh, you know, Brazil, for example, there's been ongoing conflict of interest where industries are supporting scientific research. Uh, that's happened in Mexico indirectly through, uh, uh, to, through foundations. And there is no, I have not sensed any clear federal guidelines or laws restricting conflict of interest uh, about supporting research. Um, and so this is a challenge in countries where a lot of nutrition scientists, uh, you know, in South Africa, I talk about this in, in, in Brazil, nutrition scientists in universities are often lacking sufficient funding, right? Or researchers are lacking sufficient funding. And so you have these foundations that come along that are supported by industry to provide research for these, for these app. The academics who are striving obviously to publish and, and, and there is no guidelines or any laws, clear laws that I've seen on addressing this conflict of interest with respect to research. And even less when it comes to conflict of interest in regulatory bodies. I mean, there is a recognition of this is going on, uh, but to my knowledge, still no effective laws addressing that. That's great. Um, thank you. So our next question is from um, Dr. Juan Choi. So similar to tobacco, are you aware of places where they show anti-soda or junk food commercials along with the Coke commercials? 
Oh, no, that's a great question, uh, Professor Troy. I can't think of any. I mean, that's really interesting. I've never seen an anti-soda uh, anti or anti-junk food commercials uh, anywhere. Uh, and uh, that's something telling me that, that, that really shows you where um, activists and organizations striving to increase, um, you know. Now, there has been um, campaigns by activists to increase nutrition awareness, right? And sort of, um, you know, you know, you know, Mexico. I think there's been a lot of work in increasing uh, uh, billboards and providing billboards about, you know, uh, is Coca-Cola uh, health healthy for you, right? But it pales in comparison to all the advertisements that are made on TV by the major corporations, right? Uh, that provide these foods. So there, uh, let me correct myself. There is, there have been some ins minor instances when compared to other major industries of where activists have provided information commercials. But remember in Mexico, um, you know, these groups that provide this, uh, this uh, awareness campaigns um, have been really funded and supported by, for, uh, by foundations like the Bloomberg Foundation. And not every activist group in lower middle income countries has access to this money to provide these campaigns. And that's one of the biggest problems that I talk about in my book is the lack of resources for other, other countries that are in need to increase this, this awareness. Mm -hmm. But in comparison to the major companies, there is no nothing that is comparable or similar to what for, for anti-soda, anti-junk food advertising. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so uh, final question in the question bank, although we invite more questions, we do have some more time, but um, from Jason Hale. So how might viewing soda and sugar as highly addictive substances impact any policy work? That, so how might vi viewing soda and sugar as highly addictive substances impact any policy work? I think that it's important that the more we see how addictive these foods are, uh, the more interest uh, we will have in creating policy work and addressing the policy issues. You know, as we all know, sugar is very addictive. Um, as we all know, I mean, many studies that talk about this, but also our environment, stress, lack of sleep, uh, worry, all create sort of this 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 desire for more sugar. I know that I'm very tired. Uh, you know that, that 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 craving is there. So, but sugar as an addiction, I mean, there's a ton of research on this. I think that that does increase awareness about the importance of you know providing or creating policies in response. Um, and I think that it's uh, the public needs to know more about this and we need to know more about this uh, through policy work and advocacy work. So thank you, Jason, for that, that question. Great. Well, thank you so much, um, Dr. Gomez. Really appreciate your taking the time to give this talk. And um, you know we're excited about your new book, excited to have a book launch for you uh, next week. Um, to celebrate as it goes out into the world. Um, and for those of us who've joined us, thank you so much for taking time to um, hear from one of our professors in the College of Health on his, his latest research. We hope you'll join us for our next um, symposium uh, talk, which will take place on March 27th. And that'll be with Dr. Laura Iannotti um, from uh, the Brown School at Washington University in St. Louis. So um, feel free to tune in then. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.